All right, I'm joined by Wes Reynolds at Wes Reynolds, the number one on Twitter. Again, host on VSIN and contributor to the Point Spread Weekly newsletter. Wes, how's it going today, man? Adam, doing well. How are you, sir? Doing very well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always there, man. Thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, you know, I already finished up the first segment with Brian. Now we're doing this segment here with you. And as I'm looking out there, man, these bowl game lines for this weekend, we're starting to get another wave of moves on them. Yeah, we are. Uh, as uh, And we kind of saw one yesterday. Now it's gone back to form a little bit, and that was in the uh, Frisco Bowl for Friday. The fact that, uh, and that's one I've only done the total so far, uh, took the over, which is actually now that I'm seeing it has moved. But with the Kent State-Utah State game, uh, the move was down to like seven or seven and a half, and this was the initial one after after the Lions really first came out. And then it came out that Jordan Love and a couple other players uh, uh, got busted for uh, doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing. And uh, so immediately people are going to bet that when the news came out. And I saw this blind plummet down to four and a half. Well, now the guys are cleared to play. And then now you're seeing it back up to six and a half. And that's the risk you take, you know, locking in these bowl games. And and I mentioned that earlier in the first segment that, you know, I wrote this preview nine days ago over at bangthebook.com. Didn't take a position on the game, did like the over a little bit, kind of wanted to wait it out, see how the weather forecast would look, stuff like that. That's the chance you take, man, if you try to grab some of these numbers. You you never know. And, And again, with Oklahoma now getting up to 14, as we talked about in that last segment, some whispers of suspensions for Oklahoma, in particular on the defensive side. There's a lot of risk involved with taking in some of these games early and trying to get in front of those numbers. Yeah, absolutely there is. And that's why, for the most part, when I make a lot of these bowl plays, I don't have too many early positions because I want to wait as long as possible to get the news and then uh, play against it if a line has moved too much or uh, kind of see what the market is doing or what the latest buzz is with injuries and suspension. So. I mean, I think that there's a reason why it's not, I don't think, the most prudent. I mean, if you know a good line is going to move, yeah, you want to you wanna get on that. Like uh, with uh, when LSU opened 10 in the playoff game, well, yeah, you knew that wasn't going to last. So at least laying 10, whether it wins or loses, is a, is a good number and a good bet uh, nonetheless. But, yeah, you don't want to have too many of these because because things change. And. And that's the thing over bowl season, like some of the things I would lean to early, maybe I'm not going to like as we approach game day or the, or the night before. And that 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 tends to happen. And then there's some games where you may have to buy out if you've taken a position or you got to decide, hey, do I want to just stick with my guns, even though I don't have the best number? So a couple of positions that you, you're interested in taking here for this weekend, or maybe that you've already taken, we start with the Cure Bowl. A couple of games we didn't talk about here on the first segment. This one between Liberty and Georgia Southern, game 209-210. And in fact, this is one I see kind of moving a little bit here today. Liberty down all the way to four. This one was four and a half, five throughout the early part of the week. But now we're starting to see some money come in on the Flames in their first bowl game, as we know. One of the weakest FBS schedules of all. They were 132nd per Sagarin. But you think something about this matchup kind of favors Liberty here? Yeah, and 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 they certainly uh, uh, did have a relatively weak schedule. They actually had to have seven well, wins to uh, get bowl eligible because uh, they're still kind of considered transitioning from FCS to uh, FBS. And two of their wins were over FCS schools, Maine and uh, uh, Hampton. So uh, they had to end up uh, having two wins to be able to count that. Uh, and uh, you look at that at Liberty here, uh, Georgia Southern, I mean, they're the more established program. They're probably the better program. Well, they are the better program. But I kind of like this spot a little bit for Liberty for a couple reasons. Uh, knowing that you've known about this game two or three weeks, uh, it's a little bit easier to prepare for the triple option than it would be if you just had one week or 10 days or, 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 or what have you, a short span of time, like when you're going through the season and then it's like, okay, Georgia Southern or Army or Navy or Air Force or whomever are our opponents next week. So you, very, you have very little prep time. And now you at least have more prep time going into this. And I also uh, 
spike a little bit with Liberty. The fact that I think the players, look, the players don't care, but the coaching staff probably cares because they're hired by the administration. And you got a ticked off university administration because of, uh, for people that don't know about Liberty University, they are a uh, religious institution and uh, uh, there always are political ramifications. Of course, uh, the late Jer- Reverend Jerry Falwell was the uh, president of Liberty University for so long. Now his son is in that role. And Liberty wanted to join a couple different conferences, Conference USA and the Sun Belt, where Georgia Southern is a member, uh, of course. So uh, they wanted to join those conferences and, and were rejected from doing so. And whether this is true or not, the people from the Liberty side kind of think that this was because of political ramifications, uh, because uh, obviously the, the Falwells, uh, not only with faith, but are also involved in politics and uh, have taken what some would call maybe controversial views. I'm kind of uh, treading the line here when, when, when we get into, the, into that subject. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that you might have a coaching staff kind of influenced by the administration. It's like, hey, this conference didn't want us. You know, now this is a chance to beat somebody from that from said conference and and, and really show out here because Liberty, of course, is an independent right now in football. So uh, so this is kind of a chance for them, usually a team in the first bowl uh, because they don't have that experience and they've never done anything like this before. I usually would want to go against, but I actually think that they're not too bad of a bet in this spot. Yeah, and of course, they've got a guy in Hugh Freeze who, you know, very accustomed to the, the bowl preparation period, at least until, you know, all those sanctions came down at Ole Miss. And, you know, again, I mean, there sometimes are some some interesting side angles to these games. So we talk a lot of times about the little brother versus big brother games, whether it's the non-conference in college football or the non-conference in college basketball, where that's a game you're a little bit more focused on because you want to beat, you know, that name brand program in your state. This is just a different variation of that where you want to beat a team from a conference that didn't want to take you. And yeah, maybe there is a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more in the preparation period of telling these kids, you know, we really need to be focused. It's a great opportunity for the school, great opportunity for the pro for the uh, program, so on and so forth. Just trying to motivate these guys in a way without saying, you know, Hey, this conference didn't want us. This is why our program wants this game. That's an angle I really haven't heard too much about this one. So I think that's a, a pretty interesting way of approaching it, a pretty good way of approaching it too, when you think about all the impact of motivation angles here. The one thing that concerns me a little bit is you do get extra time to prep for the option. And maybe this is something that's more relevant in like the cheese it Bowl with Washington State and Air Force. It can be hard to imitate the option. It can be hard to do that as a practice squad and give the defense something to look at. For Washington State, I mean, they can't do it. You know, they're an air raid offense. That's what their guys are recruited for. They can't try and emulate the option in practice. Maybe Liberty has a better opportunity of doing that just by the nature of the school, the nature of the recruits that they bring in, you know, a lot of FCS level talent, maybe some transfers that have seen the option, stuff like that. So maybe that helps a team like Liberty here in one of these early bowl games in terms of trying to get ready. Yeah, I I think it it absolutely does. And, uh, uh, This is clearly, I mean, one of the things Liberty's going to have to fight is the fact that they haven't had this experience before. And uh, you're kind of going to see Charlotte uh, doing that a little bit in the uh, Bahamas Bowl on Friday. And I kind of actually lean the other way in that game would uh, would lean to Buffalo just simply because uh, this is the first experience for Charlotte. And I think uh, if we watch the Mac, which I know that you do, you're kind of in Mac country there in Ohio. Buffalo probably was the best team in the MAC this year, and then they lose that game to Kent State on Thursday night, uh, where where Kent State came back. They had everything kind of go right for them in the fourth quarter, and uh, Buffalo ended up not going to the MAC championship game. But they were probably the best defense and the best rushing attack in the conference, and they certainly were actually. Uh, so uh, maybe this is a, a little bit of a get right spot for them off a off a disappointing season so yeah there's there's all unique ways to look at these things 
All right, so we go to Boca here. We look at game 211, 212, SMU and Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic has hired Willie Taggart. He won't have much to do with the bowl game outside of watching over the new personnel that he's going to have. Glenn Spencer, the defensive coordinator under Lane Kiffin, going to be the interim here for this one. Obviously, we know SMU. Not really a whole lot to worry about on the Mustang side. NFL-level talent, the skill positions. So far, no one has announced they're skipping the game. And in close proximity to the game here, I can't imagine that anybody will sit this one out. So what do you think about this one here, where Florida Atlantic essentially gets to play a home game against SMU, and they're getting three or three and a half points? Yeah, and and I do like the Mustangs here, just because uh, I think Conference USA what what was very much uh was very much down this year uh the best team in my opinion in conference usa was louisiana tech but then they they were kind of rolling to winning their division and going to the conference championship their quarterback jamar smith gets suspended they end up losing the tie or losing and not being able to go to the uh conference championship game and fau got a bat got a uab team that uh uh, a great story, and Bill Clark's a great coach, but UAB, I think, had had not really beaten anyone with a winning record except for Louisiana Tech when they were without, of course, their quarterback and their receiver. So, uh, uh, yeah, and UAB, and UAB got laid out in that spot. Uh, SMU, to me, just has been – just is, is a little bit of a step up in class and the fact that I thought that that, that conference this year – was one of the better ones on the country. SMU played a relatively uh, difficult schedule, if you will. They did have to to play at TCU. Uh, Temple was a bowl team. Memphis is a bowl team. Navy is a bowl team. Tulane is a bowl team. So uh, this offense, too, uh, they're tenth in the country. The defense, the defense isn't great. They're only a uh, hundred and second in the country, and they're especially vulnerable against the pass. Uh, 121st uh, in the country in terms of uh, passing yards allowed. But uh, you look at FAU, they've lived off a lot off turnovers, too. They're first in the country in turnover margin, getting plus 1.54 turnovers a game, which is a lot. And, uh, you know, teams, I think, when they kind of live off that, that eventually, that eventually, I think, kind of regresses to the uh, to the other side here. And, uh it's it's tempting, obviously, to take FAU as the hot team because look, they've uh, won now uh, six in a row, and actually they've won. Uh, they started out zero and two, so they've won ten of their last eleven. Uh, SMU, I know some might be thinking that they're disappointed in terms of being playing in this bowl, but SMU has kind of been trying to get back to respectability anyway under Dykes. This is their best season they've had down there in SMU. Uh, pretty much since the uh, the death penalty in the uh, mid to late 1980s. So you have an SMU team that I think is going to be focused here. I don't think that they're going to treat this as a joke just because they're not getting a power five opponent. Yeah, I mean, this is a situation where, you know, maybe SMU did have, you know, visions of going to that New Year's Six bowl bid that Memphis is in or something like that. But this is a Mustangs team that hasn't won a bowl game since 2012. They got a shot at 11 wins for the first time since 1982. I think they are motivated, especially when you consider two years ago, they got beat 51 to 10 in the Frisco Bowl. They got embarrassed in that game. So I think they are focused. I think they are motivated. I don't think Florida Atlantic is motivated here. You know, you have a new head coach. You know, you have a guy who recruits the state of Florida very, very well. I think their bowl game was the last game with Lane Kiffin because Mm -hmm. I, I think Lane Kiffin, you know, really did reestablish himself here with FAU, got himself that Ole Miss job. I think the players, you know, certainly seem to like him a, a fair amount. And they got that conference championship at home. Now that's just like playing another home game for them. And I don't know if they're going to be that excited for that. Whereas for SMU, again, getting a bowl win, sending some of these guys off to the NFL on a high note, there's a lot more incentive, I think, for SMU here. I like this one. The, the only thing that worries me is this. The early betting percentages overwhelmingly on SMU here so far. Line went to three and a half, came back down to three. I don't know. Maybe there's sharp money out there on FAU. I think it's kind of a tough sell for me. From a power rating standpoint, I have SMU minus seven on a neutral. Even if I give FAU full home field, it's four. And I don't think this game warrants full home field for them. That's what I don't get. I don't know why this line isn't four or four and a half yet, if not higher. 
Yeah, and you mentioned SMU uh, getting trounced in the Frisco Bowl a couple of years ago. Of course, that's not too far from Dallas, where SMU is located. So it was not as much of what you would consider a quasi-home game for FAU, being that it wasn't played in their stadium. But sometimes I think that's a bad team for a team to, to uh, you know, to play close to home or really at home. And it's a good t- thing for the team to go on the road and actually take a trip someplace. Uh, because, they, I mean, those are the kind of things that, that, that bond teams together. So I actually, from that travel standpoint, would favor the uh, quasi-road team here being SMU. All right, so we move over to the NFL side of the spectrum here. A couple of games on your radar for this weekend. A couple of games we haven't really talked about yet this week on the show, so I'm excited to do that. We start with game 463-464 here, New Orleans And Tennessee, New Orleans, a three-point favorite here in this one. But we've got very heavily juiced threes on the plus side for Tennessee. And we also have a straight two and a half showing up out there now as well. Surprising line move to most, but I'm getting the feeling it's not a surprising line move to you. Well, not necessarily, because if if you look at if you look at Tennessee last week, uh, They were on that winning streak. Uh, Ryan Tannehill had not lost. They're putting up the great offensive numbers. And all of a sudden, they got a little bit of attention, and and then they lose. They lay an egg, even though they came back to make it competitive uh, late in the game against Houston. That was a divisional game that they lost. So now they're a little bit behind the eight ball in the fact that they're a game back of Houston, who they'll play next week down in Houston for – essentially what will decide the division title unless Tennessee were to lose this week and Houston were to win in Tampa, then Houston's got a two game lead and Tennessee's got to hope for some help to get in the wild card. Uh, right now they're seventh. Uh, they are uh, tied with Pittsburgh, but I believe Pittsburgh has the uh, better conference record in the AFC. So that's why Pittsburgh would still get the sixth spot. And it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, a team lets you down one week and and I, I didn't I didn't bet the game that game but uh where a team kind of lays an egg or, or or lets down so now you don't want them all of a sudden well somebody's obviously wanting them because it's juiced to Tennessee we know what New Orleans has to play for here they're 11 and 3 they're tied with Seattle they're tied with uh Green Bay so I believe they'd be the 3 seed today so uh they're trying to get that either that first round by or that home field advantage. But one of the things for casual betters, because that's gonna those things are gonna be mentioned ad nauseum, these playoff scenarios in terms of in columns or on ESPN or Fox or NFL network, all the national media outlets. So they're gonna know it. And and the odds makers know it too. If you know it, they know it. I mean you all you always I think can fairly assume that. And the fact that uh New Orleans has all of this stuff to play for, yet it was only it, – it had moved from one and a half. That was the look-ahead line, and then it got adjusted to three. Well, now you're seeing the three uh, juice to the Tennessee side. So it's like knowing all that with New Orleans, knowing that New Orleans is coming off that impressive Monday night performance where Drew Brees broke the record and went 29 of 30, the best passing performance, uh, I forget however many years. Uh, but broke a bunch of different little statistical marvels, including the main thing being the all-time touchdown pass record in the National Football League. And now you go on the road, short week. This is a desperate team at home in Tennessee. And all that stuff about, oh, must win to get this buy or to get this seed, all that is priced in the market. So you are always, you are never getting a break in the line to think that, oh, oh, this line isn't right, or, oh, I've got value here. That's already accounted for in the line. Yeah, again, I mean, look where the line move is coming in. You know, a lot of times in the NFL, you can find out a lot about these games just by monitoring the market in terms of watching the timing of these line moves and watching the nature of these line moves. And again, you've got public support on New Orleans. You're always going to, and this line's coming down. And the books know if they go to two and a half, they're getting a lot more New Orleans money from people that feel like they're getting a cheap price on the saints and so far they're kind of trending towards that direction so you know it's one of those things where tennessee very very clearly the sharp side here if you want to be on the sharp side it is tennessee that's not to say the public side can't win with new orleans but 
again, as, as Wes mentioned, a lot of factors priced into the line for this game and the numbers still coming down in that one. Not really a lot of factors here in this game, but don't forget about these games over the last two weeks. I know everyone wants to be focused on, you know, Saturday's games that mean a lot or some of Sunday and Monday's games that mean a lot. Don't forget about these throwaway types of games because you're probably going to find the best betting value in a lot of these. And that's game 465, 466. Giants and Redskins. Wes, there's a side that you like here in this game. And I'm curious to get your thoughts as to why. Yeah, the side I like is actually the uh, the Washington Redskins in this spot. And everybody, the, the last, uh, what they saw of the Redskins was taking that awful beat. Uh, if you uh, had them against the Philadelphia Eagles, where the Eagles scored, you know, less than a minute to go. Redskins have a, have a turnover. Eagles uh, return that uh, fumble for a touchdown and uh, get past the number. But uh, I do like the Redskins side here for a couple reasons. One, I think if you look at the Giants last week, who had a pretty darn good second half against Miami, they were actually trailing at halftime. And they kind of got Eli Manning that feel-good moment, you know, and they showed him, they gave him the game ball after the game. It was a nice moment in the locker room for the guys. They had broken a long losing streak. They got Eli that last win at home in front of his family, in front of his wife and, and everybody and the whole Manning clan. So now they take to the road here. And you got a Redskins team that I think has played okay football down the stretch of the season. Uh, uh, la- they've been competitive in their last two losses, five-point road loss at Green Bay, and then the Eagles game was essentially decided on the last play of the game. Uh, and also, one of the things I-, I-, I like about the Redskins here is that, look, I don't think Bill Callahan is going to get that job. I think that that's pretty safe that he's probably not going to be the, the interim coach is not going to be the head coach of the Redskins last year, but uh, or next year, rather. But if you saw last week, uh, Urban Meyer was in Washington, D.C. Now, for a couple reasons, obviously, Dwayne Haskins and Terry McLaurin are former Buckeyes. So wanted to see them play. But who was Urban sitting next to up in the suite? That would be Dan Snyder, the Redskins owner. So he's being paraded around and doing interviews and and all over uh, FedEx field, uh, you know, all in in, in, in D.C. for for various things and. Bill Callahan's got to be taking a look at that, like, you know, maybe kind of pissed off and, and with the fire in his ass to, to see, okay, they're parading this coach. I'm still coaching my butt off here, trying to get this team a win and trying to get this team as many wins as possible and uh, keep this team from uh, going south. We know it's not very good, the fact that they only have three wins, but it probably could have been worse earlier in the season after Jay Gruden was fired. And I think I've at least done a pretty good job steadying the ship here so uh you might get a Redskins team that's uh a little ticked off and I mean plus when you look at the matchup uh Giants uh 28th ranked pass defense in the league I don't think they're gonna have any answer uh really uh with uh against uh that duo of Haskins and McLaurin and Haskins has been playing a little bit better I mean I'm not fully entrusting him as quarterback he still has a lot of development to do but he has played better over the, over the last couple of weeks and actually looked pretty solid. Uh, didn't turn the ball over last week. You got a Giants team that's only uh, one and six away from home. Uh, Washington, I think, has been more competitive under Callahan. So uh, I actually think that this is uh, – and these games are always tough to bet because you got two teams that are going nowhere. But uh, players don't care about draft position. Nobody's thinking about, oh, we need the number two pick because we want to get Chase Young or because we want to get Jerry Judy or we want to get whomever. These guys don't give a, a rat's you know what about that. They care about their jobs and their teammates. So they're going to be focusing on getting a win. And I just think that uh, there's more indications that that'll be on the Washington side. Yeah, that was that's an interesting last point because you know I texted a buddy of mine who's a Giants fan on Sunday and I was like, oh, you know, I'm I'm glad they got that win for Eli. You know, it was it's pretty awesome. And he goes, yeah, and it also means we could pick fifth in the draft. And and it's it's kind of one of those things where you know you're happy for Eli at the same time when looking at the future of the organization of the team. You know, the draft position thing does matter. So does it matter in terms of game day? 
I don't know, probably not. I would tend to lean, you know, certainly as far as the players go with your side of it. At the same time, the Giants, they're kind of disincentivized to set them up for set themselves up for success in this game. They got the Eli game. They wanted that. They needed to get that for his sake. Do they need this game? No, I don't think so. And with Haskins getting better with the Redskins, maybe kind of building towards something a little bit, and just the outright emotional letdown for the Giants coming off of everything that transpired last week, I think Washington has to be the side here. And I think that I wouldn't be surprised if this line does move up to three at some point this week. Yeah, I think it will. I'll be interested to see when the uh, when the Super Contest lines come out today at the Westgate uh, and then the Circa lines on Thursday because uh, what those guys try to do is put a line in terms of where they think the line is going to go. It's not like, okay, it's 5 o'clock Pacific or whatever. This is where the line is, so we're automatically going to put out that line. So I very well think you could see three in the contest, just like with that other game, New Orleans, Tennessee, that we talked about a few minutes ago. That could be two and a half. Wes Reynolds is working and find on Twitter at Wes Reynolds and the number one. Also hear him on VEASAN and read his stuff in VEASAN's Point Spread Weekly newsletter. Wes, when can people check you out on the show or in the newsletter, man? Okay, uh, yeah, the uh, Point Spread Weekly newsletter and obviously the VEASAN uh, College Bowl betting guide uh, out this week. So uh, be sure to check that out. And then uh, on the Green Zone, uh, Thursday and Friday, 8 to 10 Pacific time. Saturday, 2 to 6 in the afternoon Pacific time. And Sunday, 3 to 7, along with Monday, 6 to 10. Well, obviously, next week, Christmas, the following week, New Year's Day. So no shows for us here on Wednesday, the next couple of weeks. So, Wes, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you and yours, man. Happy New Year. And we'll talk to you again in 2020. Same to you, Adam, and same to all the listeners here at Bang the Book as well. 